special places are all around us. In every country, city, town, village and throughout the countryside. Places treasured for their beauty. Places rich in history and tradition. Grand places that are famous all over the world. Hidden places that hold the promise of discovery. Humble places that remind us of how we became the way we are. And places change. We can't hold back the clock. We can't stand still. We wouldn't want to keep everything the same forever, even if we could. But what about these special places? How do we know which ones to protect? How much change can a place stand and still be special? That's exactly what a group of Australian heritage professionals wanted to know when they got together in 1979 at Burra in South Australia. Experience had shown that if work at special places isn't done very logically and carefully, it's easy to do more harm than good. They wrote guidelines for making good decisions about heritage places so that their special qualities could be preserved and the pitfalls avoided. The document they wrote is called the Burra Charter. It sets out logical procedures for caring for those special places we want to keep as part of Australia's heritage. The Burra Charter has since won worldwide recognition as an excellent statement about what to do when you're caring for a heritage place. Every place is unique with its own distinctive reasons for being so important. Chambers Pillar is in a place that's part of my mother's country. And you can't appreciate the significance of, of this object just by looking at it. Aborigines of that region explain the myth of Chambers Pillar through the story of a great warrior who came into the region and he killed many other local warriors and took their women. The pillar represents the dead body of that great warrior who exists in the dream time and the bodies of the women are represented by Castle Rock. This is a very important place for other Australians too. The Burra Charter helps us to make good decisions about looking after places like this. In the case of built environments, it's just as important to manage special places in ways that ensure their significance endures. A 1970s scheme to redevelop Sydney's historic Rocks Precinct with high-rise buildings was prevented by local residents' protests and green bans by the Builders' Labourers' Federation, led by Jack Mundy. And the coming together of the resident action groups, uh, progressive architects, engineers and other citizens linking up with the Builders' Labourers to in fact hold up work so as to allow ordinary residents a say in the planning process. There's a logical order for making decisions about the way in which we approach heritage concern. If we take the Borough Charter, it calls for us to take it step by step so as we really appreciate the significance of the different places that we want to conserve and preserve. This wonderful painting of Tom Roberts dates back to 1894, the famous Shearing Shed painting uh, from Newstead in uh, the New England district of New South Wales. One of the unique features about the painting is that the shed in which the painting took place still stands today. I mean, apart from the connection with Tom Roberts, this shed is very important because of what it can tell us about how people built buildings. Uh, at this time. 
This rotating table is made for, um, for skirting the fleece. It's made from a wheel and axle of a sulky. You can see in the fabric of the building how the builders split and sawed and chopped and chiselled the parts and put them together. And you can see how the shed was enlarged and how the machinery was put in. That was soon after Tom Roberts um, painted this, the picture and uh, how the shed was changed about. So how do you, uh, how do you look after a place like this? Um, after I had a very careful inspection of the building, I uh, advised the owners to um, change it as little as possible, but um, to just make some fairly minor repairs that were needed to leave the building strong enough to stand for a lot longer. I uh, like this new bit of timber. It's a splint to reinforce a raft of the termites have eaten. The old damaged piece is kept, but this splint makes the whole structure strong again. Look closely and you'll find a date stenciled on the new timber. Every new piece of timber is marked like this, so that you can tell the difference between the old and the new. It's a good honest repair that keeps all the evidence in its place. One of the most important pieces of advice the Borough Charter offers is this. Do as much as necessary, but as little as possible. It's fortunate that the private owners of Newstead Shearing Shed had both the desire and the means to preserve it as a monument. Most buildings, even heritage places, have to earn their keep by some useful function in the life of their communities. In fact, most buildings are best looked after when they're in use. The Borough Charter points out that once you understand why a place is important, the next thing to do is to understand its fabric, the stuff the place is made of. There were several things that attract us to the place. Um, I think when we first came up here looking for a house in Goulburn, we really wanted something which was older that we could um, feel comfortable in and this place looked impressive from the outside. I became involved with this project as heritage advisor to Goulburn City Council. The building was built in the early 1900s as a duplex by a pair of building tradesmen brothers and the building is important from the architectural features and the design of the of the building but also its interesting history. I was asked to advise on some horror areas of rising damp, falling damp, cracking, uh, blemishes in joinery, all sorts of fabric oriented issues. There were issues that they resolved because they engaged the services of a very competent builder who was familiar with many of the building techniques. Uh, the other tradesmen such as painters and plasterers were also familiar with traditional techniques and I think their contribution to the project must be uh, well and truly acknowledged. Combining the, my input, combining the Brady's sense of commitment and the competence of the tradesmen, the project was destined to succeed. We didn't expect actually 10 years work, but that's what it panned out to be in the end, so... But it paid off in the long run. Of course, heritage places come in all shape and all sizes, and of many different kinds. Often public facilities have both a personal and public history for a whole range of people in the community. Sometimes these associations are the best reasons for conserving them. The little group called Friends of the Baths just wanted to keep the pool going. We were mainly pool users and at the time council was looking at a major refurbishment which cost far more than could possibly be sustained and it also took away much of the character of the building of the place. So we just started lobbying and so that we had a big contingent of people on council who are committed. But that's how we did it. We do a lot of the work, the community members, and we have a number of different people in the community with different skills, including Peter Hickey, who's an architect who gave a lot of time. Well, I'm a swimmer here, 
and um, the Friends of the Baths came and uh, uh, suggested I might give them a help in the early stages because it had already been decided that the superstructure had to go and people weren't that interested or some people weren't that interested in this little building and they were going to take it down and start on the superstructure and um, we knew if it went down without having been documented it would be lost. First of all marked it, everything, so every column's gone back where it was, every member in the in the structure was marked, then it was dismantled and then after this had been redone it was rebuilt. All the beams were used, about half of the joists were used, all of the roof beams and, and rafters were used again. Oh, I first became involved as a swimmer uh, coming here regularly in the morning uh, for exercise. So I helped the um, pool users to um, establish the importance of the pool, um, its heritage significance. Uh, we ran a workshop with pool users one Saturday morning and took photographs of the pool working in pairs. The key things were they very much liked the interaction with the natural environment. Uh, other things that they liked were the green and cream colour scheme, the informal atmosphere of the pool, meeting their friends. We have an archives room and we have some wonderful records lots of water polo and some swimming and we've had lots of Olympians. In Heritage Week and things like that we have it open and people can come and they look for their grandparents and that sort of thing. It's, yeah, it's quite interesting. And we now have had a conservation plan done for the items in the room. This condition survey um, provides advice to the swimming club about how to look after their archives. Uh, it will help the club um, set priorities in terms of which things to restore and uh, how to provide better conditions so that the archives can remain at the place. Uh, it sets the framework for best possible borough charter practice. It's a hard business fighting to save things and you do have to learn to go beyond the bounds of uh, normal politeness in order to save things you have to be able to question other people's decisions uh, in order to ensure that all things are looked at very thoroughly. In this case, um, the Friends of the Baths and the pool users uh, questioned the initial advice that was given by specialists and said, you know, effectively, we've got to rethink this. Aren't there other ways in which we can keep the pool the, the way we like it and still make it um, useful in the future with um, less maintenance? Oh, it's a fabulous result, uh, a partnership between the council and the community. Uh, and from a heritage perspective, um, it's kept all the very good things about the pool and secured it for the future. And it's built a lot of social capital in our community. Yeah, I think it's been a great thing. I think it's a good symbol of what we've done and what you can do if you try. Yeah, and I love swimming here too. <laughs>any other urban park perhaps. Musgrave Park was first formed um, when the town of Brisbane was surveyed uh, middle of last century and since then the parks remained although its edges have been nibbled away for various uh, land acquisitions for churches and schools. I worked on a conservation study of the park for the City Council. It was done by a small group of experts, an architect, that's me, a historian, a landscape architect and a conservation planner. But it wasn't just a job for experts. We wouldn't have understood what this place was about without talking to the people who use it. And some of them have strong opinions. I find it a very special place. And I think because Aboriginal people do frequent the park and they have for many, many years, 
and I think traditionally and um, as we live in a contemporary sense that it will always be that way for Aboriginal people to acknowledge this place as such as uh, um, an Aboriginal place and I pay respect to the traditional people that have been here for a long time and, and to us people that are around the park today. We needed to know what the various communities found important about the park and so we went and talked to, to uh, uh, the community groups that had, a, that had an interest, the, uh, the Greek community, the Aboriginal community. Um, and um, from talking to them, we, we understood the richness and complexity of those uh, community associations with the park. For the Greek community, their annual Paniiri festival was very important, and the park was the site for that for many years, still is. It had been thought at the beginning that the, it could be quite fractured and uh, diverse, the points of view about the park, but in the end a really good clear consensus emerged which was really important. Council and state government um, have wanted to support the aspirations of Aboriginal people for an Indigenous cultural centre in the park and the study helped us to identify a place in the park where that would be possible and indeed clarified that that uh, that such a cultural centre would be consistent uh, with the values and uh, uh, heritage of the park over a long time. The conservation study produced a series of recommendations about how to look after the park, all of them based directly on aspects of its significance. When we discussed the uh, draft conservation study with the, with the community group at the, uh, at the public workshop, the community was really keen to keep the park as it is, even slightly run down. They saw that as part of the character of the place. People weren't terribly concerned about other conservation measures. They didn't want it reconstructed in some historical form. Neither did they want any um, electric barbecues installed. They really liked the informality of the character of the park and the way people use it. They wanted those values to continue. There's a logical order for doing everything in managing and caring for our heritage places. Taking a look before we start making choices and decisions can help us make the right ones at the right time and help us avoid unfortunate or expensive mistakes. Following this straightforward step-by-step -step advice, we can be sure that we understand the significance of a place, let significance guide our decisions, do everything in a logical order, do as much as necessary, but as little as possible. Consider the fabric. Recognise people's attachment to a place. Keep records. Listen to the community and appreciate cultural differences. So, this is it, the Borough Charter. If you can use some straightforward advice about looking after a heritage place, whether you're an owner, a planner, a developer, a councillor, or someone who wants to share the places you love with the next few generations, look here first.